the end of unhappiness. The end of unhappiness. I believe we can put an end to an unhappy life. And happiness is really the number one pursuit and desire of every human being on the face of this earth. There's no doubt about it. Everybody who seeks fame is simply seeking happiness through that fame. Everybody that seeks uh, a husband or a wife is seeking happiness by seeking that husband or that wife. Everybody that wants a child and wants a baby and wants a family is seeking, ultimately they're seeking happiness by wanting that baby and wanting that family. Everybody that seeks fortune and success and financial success is truly seeking happiness. It's not the financial success that they're truly after. It's the belief, it's the belief that happiness is on the other side, that the pot of gold is not on the other side of the rainbow, but that happiness is on the other side of the pot of gold. Well, we know the truth is, is that happiness is not on the other side of a marriage. Happiness, I mean, not the, that's, that's probably not exactly how I meant that. Uh, but in other words, just getting married is not going to make you happy. If you're not happy as a single person, you're not going to be happy as a married person. I'm telling you the truth. If you're lonely as a single person, you'll be lonely as a married person because another person is not the ultimate, uh, the ultimate uh, cure for loneliness, but the, but the Holy Spirit and Jesus. Jesus is the ultimate cure for loneliness. Can anybody say amen? Because if marriage was the cure for loneliness, then all of you single people, raise your hand if you're single. Raise your hand if you're single. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Don't be ashamed. Raise your hand if you're single. Raise your hand if you want to be single. Just kidding. Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand to that. But raise your hand if you're single. If, if, then if, if you had to be married to be happy, then you're doomed to misery until you get married. And then your motivation for getting married is to pursue your own happiness. And that's really a selfish reason to get married. So that's like a vicious cycle of unhappiness that is going to that is going to surround and 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 suffocate your life. And God has a way better plan for you. You and Jesus can be happy. Jesus in your life can make you happy when you truly are walking with him and talking with him. Yes, we're saved by his grace and we're loved by him. But as we think on and meditate on and talk with him and listen to him, that's when we truly enjoy our relationship with God and we enjoy life and we find true happiness. Well, we'll get into that a little bit more in a few moments. But uh, again, the, the highest desire, there is no higher or deeper desire in this world, in the heart of man, than happiness. It's the single most intoxicating emotion that drives most decisions that we make in life. Like, you, nobody says, well, you know, you know how we leave church and maybe we leave church or maybe your family's out and you're like, OK, what are we going to eat tonight? Let's go out to eat. Where are we going to eat? And, you know, and one person says, well, let's eat here. And one person says, let's eat here. Or, and really nobody can really decide because all the restaurants around here are crummy anyway. But you know what I'm saying? Uh, but you just like, oh, where are we going to eat? Well, you're not picking a place to eat. Because just because you're hungry, you're picking a place to eat because you have memories associated with eating there makes you happy. You have memories associated that that Portillo's hot dog brings you a smile, right? That Coke, that Coke is a smile, that Coke makes you smile, that Coke makes you happy, that you're opening up happiness when you open up a can of Coke. You have a memory associated by either by the brand awareness and the and and the brand uh, marketing that that company has done to make you feel that having Coke will make you happy. And I do know of a certain form of Coke that makes people happy, but that's not what I'm talking about today. And it's not something that I would encourage you to do because it has negative side effects that can destroy your life. But my point is, is that you, you have this memory associated with this experience or this food. And so it's not because we're all hungry and we're all going to eat something. But you but you the reason you choose to eat the thing you choose to eat is because it, it makes you happy. Now, different people say, well, what about people that are really strict about what they eat? Well, it's the same principle because ultimately what makes them happy is that they are eating healthy and the result of eating healthy is that they're in better shape physically and emotionally. So really, it's the same thing. It's the same reason they're still choosing to eat that food because ultimately their pursuit is still happiness. It's not 
the food, it's the, what the food will end up producing or making them feel like or what they believe it'll make them feel like. Because how many know you like, haven't had fries in a while and you're like, man, I'm going to eat these fries and you eat them all, you eat three orders. And then when you're done and three biggie fries, right? And you eat every one of them and while you're eating them, it's like, oh, these are so good, these are so good, these are so good, these are so good. And then when you're done, you're like, oh, I hate the fact that I ate all of them, <laughs> right? So they really didn't make you happy. They did for a while, temporarily, while you believed they made you happy. But then when you realized they were going to make you fatter, then you're not so happy. Don't everybody say amen at once. I know, you know, this is spiritual stuff, man. This will really help you grow. The tragedy of man's search is not that he cannot find happiness, but that he searches for it in the wrong places. That's the tragedy. But the gospel, what is the gospel? The gospel is that God is love, God is good, and God in his great love and mercy has sent Jesus to save you from your sins, forgive you of your sins, fill your heart with his love, and give you a life that is beyond what you could ever ask or ever think or ever imagine. The gospel of Jesus Christ coming to save you and love you with no strings attached, that is an invitation to happiness. The gospel is the ultimate invitation to happiness. And so we, as we end this year and go into the new year, I want you to know as long as you come to this church, you're going to hear the gospel. The gospel is the good news. It's the good news of God's love. It's the good news of God's grace. It's the good news of the cross. It is finished. Jesus did it all. There's nothing left for you to do to complete the work of Jesus Christ. Now what we get to do, now our, now our work is to tell the world about the complete work of Jesus Christ. It's to tell the world that Jesus did it all. It's to tell the world that he loves you. It's to tell the world that it is finished. It's to tell the world world that God is for you, not against you. It is to tell the world that he's not mad at you. He is mad about you. That's the gospel. That's our mission. That's what we're doing. And that'll make you happy. Hearing that message and sharing that message will make you the happiest person on earth. If you don't hear that message, if you don't share that message, you are limiting your happiness. You are limiting. You are you are minimizing your happiness. You are cutting off the source of true happiness because the gospel, the very word gospel is good news and good news makes you happy. Everybody on this earth, when they hear good news, they are happy when they hear good news. And the best news of all is behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The best news of all is Jesus crucified and rose from the dead and you can be born again simply by accepting him and receiving him as your savior and as your Lord. That's the good news. That's the gospel. Are you with me? By the way, at the end of the service, we've got some shirts. We have the cool. We have the coolest shirts now. I don't know. I saw one of these. I saw somebody wearing the shirt in our church. Yeah, I saw Iris, one of our worship leaders. She was wearing this church, this shirt, and it said on the front, God's not mad at you. And then on the back, he's mad about you. And I said, how come my name's not on there? Because that's my quote. <laughs> that's my quote. The first time I said that was in 1992, I think, before we even started as a church. Because I, that was what God told me. God spoke to me. He said, I'm not mad at you. I'm mad about you. And that's been my message ever since. And, you know, and I hope that you're hearing it and I hope that you're feeling it. And I hope that you. And so, you, by the way, so I thought, wow, nice shirt. I said, so let's order some more of those. So we have some. If you want, if you want to get a late Christmas present on the way out, you can buy some of those. Joel, Joel has. Joel, are you wearing one? Oh, April's wearing one, too. Come on, look at that. God is not mad at you. He is mad about you. But I'm going to need some quotes, quote marks around that phrase. <laughs> people are going to steal that. People have been stealing that ever since. I hear people saying that. You got that from me. Stop that. <laughs> Boy, but I needed it the most. And that's why maybe God spoke it to me. Because I always thought God was mad at me. I was mad at me. I was mad at myself. I was mad at, you know, at, at being born. You know, um, so... But God, 
he reached, he reached me. He found me. He, he told me, I'm not mad at you. I'm mad about you. I'm crazy about you. I love you. You're the best. And he was right. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> All right. <laughs> look, at, look at Revelation 19, verse 7. As somebody said, are you, oh, you're finally going to share a scripture? Uh, <laughs> Revelation chapter 19, verse 7. Let us be glad and rejoice. Why? First of all, he tells us, let us be glad. Whose idea was it to be glad? It was God's idea. He said, let us be glad and rejoice and give the glory to him. Why can we be glad and rejoice? Why? For the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride or wife has made herself ready. We're the bride of Christ. If you're born again, you're a part of the bride of Christ. And he says, let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him. Why should, what will make us rejoice and be glad? For the marriage of the lamb has come. In other words, the gospel is not an invitation to a funeral. It's an, it's an invitation to a wedding. It's an invitation to a wedding. And what happens at weddings? People laugh. People smile. People get married. People kiss. People hug. People, you know, eat. People celebrate. People rejoice. People hug. People dance. People move. They, at least they try to dance. People, but they, they at least move in certain ways. Some call it dancing. But the, the fact is, is that what is a wedding? It's a feast. It's a celebration. The gospel is not an invitation to a funeral. It's an invitation to a wedding. And the wedding is between you and Jesus, me and Jesus, us and Jesus. We all get to marry the bride. None of us, or we all get to marry the groom, I should say. None of us are just spectators at the wedding. We're all a part of the wedding party. And it's not like, well, she's closer or he's closer to the Lord. No, we're all at the table. We all get to rejoice. I don't know how it's going to, I don't know what the table's going to look like or feel like, but I do know this. And I don't know how far, you know, it's going to stretch when we go to heaven. But let me tell you something. Every one of us is going to feel like Jesus is right next to us and that we're right next to him because the marriage of the lamb has come and his wife his bride has made herself ready and you and I are his bride. And I don't know any bride that walks down the altar. I don't know any bride that walks down the aisle to the altar. Sad. Now, that, that's no guarantee what happens after the altar. That's why you got to go to our pre-marriage class, because that'll help you. That'll help you. You know, that, that'll help you brace yourself. <laughs> <laughs> People are like, uh, 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 should I laugh at that? Uh, uh, uh. If you've had a marriage with no problems, then you died on your honeymoon. <laughs> I don't know. That just came to me. All right, let's go. Let's keep going. Let us rejoice. This marriage, this wedding between Jesus and us, man, this is the wedding to end all weddings. It's the last wedding that's ever going to take place because it is the best wedding that's ever going to take place. And it is going to be us spending forever and ever and ever with our Savior, our best friend, our bridegroom Jesus, our husband, the rose of Sharon, the lily of the valley, the king of kings, the lord of lords, the friend that sticks closer than a brother, the one who will never leave us or forsake us, the one who will love us with everlasting love, the one who is and was and is to come. That's the one you're getting married to. You are getting married. Let me tell you, single people, rejoice and be glad because the wedding of the Lamb, the marriage of the Lamb has come. You don't have to, hey, 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 you don't have to be glad and rejoice. You don't have to be waiting for Luther. You don't have to be waiting for Johnny. You don't have to be waiting for, you know, Marco. You don't have to be waiting for anybody. You go, you've, got, you've, got, you've got a wedding coming up between you and Jesus. You say, well, that's good for women. What about us men? That's the same for us, guys. The greatest relationship that you could ever have with anybody is your relationship with him. To in, in, in on earth, I'm in, on earth. I can be a husband, but on, but in heaven, I get to be a wife. I mean, you know, I know that sounds kind of weird, but it, it sounds kind of cool. You know, sorry, ladies, you only get to be 
a wife. <laughs> All right, scratch that from the um, recording. That's, that doesn't really fit in. All right, let's keep going. Listen, listen, the gospel is an invitation to happiness. It's a wedding feast that we've been invited to, not a funeral. And we are the bride of Christ. And every bride wants a joyous, big wedding. And every bride is thrilled that it's her day. And, any, and anybody that doesn't get to be the bride, they're happy for the bride, but not as happy as if they were the bride. And, and, and of course, obviously, it depends on who the groom is, you know, like, OK, let's check this guy out. All right. But we don't have to do that with Jesus. He's been checked out. He's the king of kings. He's the Lord of lords. There's fire in his eyes. He's got hair white like wool. You know, what, what do they call that now? You know, that, you know, salt and pepper kind of vibe. And, you know, as the guy gets older. Silver fox. <laughs> Jesus is the ultimate silver fox. His hair. His eyes. He's tatted up. He's got on his thigh written. He is the word of God on one side. He is the word of God on the other side. King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, can you imagine that? Can you imagine how cool that looks? <laughs> and he's got this white horse and he's coming riding on it and he's got and, and he and, and literally the Bible says there's fire in his eyes. Read the book of Revelation about Jesus and how amazing he is and how awesome he is. Oh, yes, he came the first time as the suffering lamb. He came the first time as the suffering sheep. He came the first time as a suffering servant. But let me tell you something for the wedding. He is unveiling himself. He might have come as a frog, but he is coming back as the prince. He might have come as the suffering servant, but he is coming back as the king of all glory, the husband of all husbands, the man among men, the king of kings and lord of lords. And what a day that's going to be. So let us get ready for that. He said, let us rejoice and be glad for the marriage of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. So let's get ready. How do we get ready? Start expecting it. How do we get ready? Start enjoying him. Start enjoying the relationship you have with him now, because right now it's kind of like the engagement right now. You're engaged to him and the wedding is coming and it's going to be amazing. And I don't know when it's going to happen. It might happen during the rapture. It might happen after the rapture. I don't care. I just I'm just glad I'm going to be there. But every person that doesn't understand the gospel is an unhappy person. And there are many people that are saved. They're saved, but they're unhappy. Because they don't understand the gospel. They understand that they're saved by God's grace, but they don't understand anything more than that. And so they can be miserable people. And frankly, there is it's like the Bible talks about how in the last days and I'm not saying that we're in the last of the last days. I don't know if Jesus is coming back in our lifetime or in our children's lifetime or our children's children. I don't know, but he could very well come back in our lifetime and we should be ready for that. We should we should prepare as if he's not, but we should be ready as if he is as if he is coming back in our lifetime. But we should plan as if he's not coming back in our lifetime, but we should be prepared in our heart as if he is coming back in our lifetime. But but I, I need you to understand something. The Bible talks about as the days approach the end times that the light will get lighter and the darkness will get darker and and people will be offended. The Bible talks about people will be unthankful, ungrateful. They, they will basically if you leave, if you look at Second Timothy, chapter three, it talks about the condition of man in the last days. And he talks about people that are lovers of self, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. He talks about how they how people are unthankful and ungrateful, how people um, have forsaken God and no longer are thankful and giving glory to God, but instead glorifying people. And the Bible talks about all of these things that will happen in the last days. And as a result, listen, remember, as a result of Matthew chapter 10, excuse me, Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. Let's look at that. Matthew chapter 24, verse 10. He said um, in the last days that many will be offended and betray one another and hate one another. So you have people that are offended, betraying and hateful. And so if you've been offended and you've been or if you've been betrayed or if you've been hated or if you've done the offending or done the betraying and done the hating, you're 
you know, you're, you're, you're part of the, you're operating in the world's way of looking at life and you're going to be miserable because look at what he says in the next verse in verse um, go, go to verse 12. Let's jump right to that for time's sake. And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Now, you remember when I shared this with you, when he says the love of many will grow cold, that word cold is the word sixos, um, which is where we get the word psycho from. It's the word sixos, which is where we get the word psycho from, spelled P S P. I think it's P S Y X O S. And it's where we get it's literally where we get the word psycho from psychotic, crazy. Uh, in other words, when your love, when 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 there's a lack of love, then you're going to go crazy. You're not going to be happy. You're going to be miserable when you're offended and when you're betrayal, when you betray, when you hate, when you let hate and offense and betrayal grow inside of your heart, then you begin to go crazy because Love is the only thing that makes you right. Love is the only thing that makes your mind right. Love and the goodness of God and the grace of God. The love of many will grow cold or many will grow crazy because their love has been quenched. That's why remember what Jesus said to the people that were backslid backslidden in Revelation chapter two. He said, you guys have done all these great works. You've done all the right things on the outside but you've left your first love. You've done the religious rituals, but you've left your first love. Return to your first love and then you'll get back to doing things from the right motive. The motive is love. The motive is goodness. The motive is the goodness of God. God's been good to me. God's loved me. Therefore, I'm going to love you. Are you with me still? So. So people are people are losing their minds now. Let me say some things about that as we end this year out, because I want to go into the new year and I really have an agenda for the new year for for, for me and for what, what God's called me to do. And, and we launched for the last several years our fast and wrong thinking later in the year. But we're launching it in the, in the middle of January this year because we want everybody to have their mind renewed and we want everybody to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We're not fasting from food this coming new, new year. You can fast from food. We, we may have some times where we fast from food, but we're going on a fast from wrong thinking um, sometime in the middle of January. Make sure to sign up for that. It's free, as you know, and we've done this. And because I believe that wrong believing and wrong thinking is what creates wrong living, that too many people are trying to fix their wrong lifestyle, their wrong living, their wrong habits their wrong living patterns. But that's not what you can't bring lasting change to your life by just changing your habits. You bring lasting change to your life by changing the way you think. And this is what this this is a, a, a tool. This is a, a a this is God's this is a mechanism that God's given us to renew our mind to God's way of thinking, because as we think God's way, we begin to live God's way. So our focus should be on what we believe and what we're thinking, and then we'll experience supernatural healing and deliverance and freedom and and joy and happiness in our lives. And and again, the, the whole I, I've been studying this for a long time now, the whole idea of mental health and mental wellness versus mental illness and mental illness has been a I guess it's kind of been a something that has caused a lot of shame in people when, you know, like, let me ask you something. If you got a if you um, if you're seeking dental health, is there anything to be ashamed of that you went to the dentist to get some dental health? Well, just change one letter from dental to mental. And we need more mental health than we need dental health, you know, because I know a lot of people with some bad teeth. I'm telling you right now. And you know, all they need to do is go get some dental help. And you know what? If you've got bad emotions and bad feelings and you're depressed and you're unhappy and you think there's something wrong with you, you know what? You know what you do? You do the same thing that if you got if you got a if you got a sore tooth, the same thing if you got an illness in your tooth, a cavity in your tooth uh, a, a damage to one of your roots. It, it, you, what do you do? You go to the dentist, you get dental health. Why? Because there's nothing to be ashamed of in getting dental health and there should be nothing that you're ashamed of for getting mental health. And you know what? 
And, and let, me let me just tell you why that's so important. And, and this is a place to start. Right in church is where you're going to begin to find, at least a church like this, you're going to begin, and not that we're better than anybody or claim to be better than anybody, but our focus is on the soul being healthy, the soul being renewed. Your spirit is born again, but your soul needs to become healthy through the renewing of your mind. Are you, st are you still with me on this? It's going somewhere here. We've got just a few minutes. But, um, but if you're still of the belief that mental health conditions aren't as devastating as physical uh, health conditions, a new report will open your eyes because a lot of people think, well, you know, physical illness is far worse and needs far greater and quicker attention. Like if you got shot by uh, if you if you were shot multiple times in your stomach, you wouldn't say, you know what, I'm strong enough. I can handle this. I can do this on my own. You know what? No, nobody says, uh, you know what? I know I need that tooth pulled. You know what? I'm strong enough. I can do that myself. Yeah, really? You're going to tie a string to your tooth? And you're going to tie it to the door and you're going to shut the door and pull your... Nobody wants to pull their tooth out by themselves unless you're, you know, what's his name from... Um, unless you're Tom Hanks from the movie uh, Castaway. Thanks, Wilson. But you know what I'm saying? It's... it's it, it, nobody, nobody thinks about, oh, I, I can do this on my own. And yet when it comes to their mental well-being, people do have that sense of, I can do this on my own. But you don't even have that with your tooth with your mental health or with your with your dental health how are you going to do that with your mental health but if you, in case you're wondering the highest listen this is a recent study the highest health care cost in america according to the huffington post is mental illness the highest it didn't used to be but now it is depression alone is estimated at a cost of over 210 billion dollars per year in america alone depression alone is estimated at a cost of over $210 billion per year in America alone. The U.S. Centers for Medi Medicare and Medicaid Services say heart, heart conditions were the, are the second costliest condition, falling far behind mental disorders. So, ment so heart conditions are at $147 billion per year in America. Mental conditions are $210 billion a year. And then trauma and injury we're the third at 143 billion. So you have mental illness at 210 billion, then you have heart conditions at 147 billion, and then you have trauma and injury at 143 billion. A lot has changed. And you say, well, has that always been that way? No, a lot has changed in the last 20 years. Listen to this. Heart conditions outweighed mental disorders in 1996. Cardiovascular health care costs were 105 billion in 1996, and mental disorders came in second at 79 billion in 1996. So in 21 years or so, or a little over 20 years, mental health care and mental health services cost has gone from 79 billion per year to 210 billion per year, which is almost tripled in 20 years. Now, if, that doesn't, if that's not staggering to you, it should be in light of the scriptures that in the last days he describes what people would be like. And one of the things that he says that people would be like in the last days is that they would be ungrateful. And no wonder that there is a tripling of mental health disorders in the last 20 years because unthankfulness has increased so significantly in the last 20 years. And in the last days, it says in 1 Timothy 3 and 1 Timothy 4, people would be unthankful and ungrateful people. And I want us to end this year thankful and grateful people and go into the new year with the greatest attitude that you can have. And the greatest attitude you can have going into the new year is an attitude of gratitude. That is the greatest attitude you can have going into the new year. And the reason why this is so important, and I'm going to get into this tonight a little bit more in detail, and you'll, I think you'll really be glad. But if you, it, we made a list last Sunday of the things that will make us happy, and this one that I didn't get to, that I want to get to, and that I'm saying, talking about now, is thankfulness. Thankfulness. You know, they say that people who are pursuing happiness are less likely to find it because when you're pursuing it, you're usually just pursuing what will make you feel better. And when self, and when your focus is on self, happiness 
runs and happiness eludes your grasp. But when your focus is on gratitude and gratefulness for what God has already done in your life, happiness seeks after you. It doesn't run from you. It actually runs to you. And if I could say this about, um, if I can find this about happiness, or excuse me, about thankfulness, is that Paul listed it as one of the signs of the end times and included it as in the verse with covetousness, pride, blasphemy, and unholiness in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. But happiness is the overflow. Or excuse me, yes, that's, that's what I meant to say. Happiness is the overflow of on focusing, the overflow of focusing on what God has already done for you. Thanks is the antidote. It's the remedy to counteract the effects of poison and disease, of the poison of pride, the poison of doubt, the poison of unbelief, the poison of selfishness, and the poison of unhappiness. The antidote, the thing to drink, if you're unhappy, the antidote, the cure for unhappiness, for selfishness, for doubt, for unbelief, for fear, for pride, the antidote is thanks. The antidote is thanks for what God has already done. Remember in Luke 17, verse 15, 10 lepers were cleansed, one turned back to give thanks. One turned back and he came to give thanks. And there's something about that one. He didn't turn back to give thanks because he learned the, that was the religious thing to do. No, he turned back to give thanks because he saw that he was healed. It says in verse 15, and one of them, when he saw... When he saw, when he saw, I pray your eyes will be open this year, next year. I pray your eyes will be open today. When he saw that he was healed, if we would just see what God has done, if we would see, if we would stop focusing on what we want God to do for us and focus on seeing what he has already done for us, that guy that saw he was healed returned, he returned, he returned. That word return is the same as the word repentance. He changed his mind and he changed his direction. Where did his repentance come from? He saw that he was healed. He saw that God was good to him. He saw that he didn't deserve it and God was still good and God healed him and Jesus touched him. And when he saw that he was healed, he turned and he came running with a loud voice and he glorified God. And verse 16 says, and he fell down on his face at his feet. He did not do this as a religious ritual. He did this as a response to seeing, whoa, whoa wait, 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 where, that leprosy was all over me. It's gone. It's not there. It's not here. He's not, he's checking himself. He's going, whoa, it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. And he turns and he starts running to Jesus and falls at his, on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And Jesus said, weren't there 10 that were cleansed? All of them were cleansed. What was the difference? One, the one focused his attention on what God had done. He saw that he was healed. He saw that he was healed. He focused on that he was healed. Seek the kingdom of God. In other words, focus on what God has done. The kingdom of God is not, it doesn't mean seek first the kingdom of God, be religious and act like you're so holy and you don't have, and you don't listen to secular music because we know you, you do. You don't, you don't watch bad movies because we know you do. I was talking to one guy, the other day, and he's like, he's like, man, I, I used to, I used to drink and smoke and cuss, and I looked at him. I'm like, he's like, but God turned me around, and I'm like, oh, I still cuss sometimes. And he's like, what, 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 what? And he went on to do the other things that he was doing. It was a business situation, and then he stopped for a minute. He's like, you know, you got me there on the cuss thing. I, I've been doing that too. <laughs> I said, dude, I was just playing with you, man. <laughs> All right, come on, let's stand up. Let's get out of here. Uh, I want you to look back at this year and see what God has done. Because, and when we go into the new year, we're going to stay focused on what God has done. Not what, not the, the, what makes the new year miserable is that you're all focused on, oh, these are the things I want to change this year. And look, I've, I've watched for years, people. New years don't change anything. New mindsets do. In Jesus' name, the end.